Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. I'm Nick Miles, and in the early hours of Friday the 26th of January, these are our main stories. President Biden has appointed the CIA chief, William Burns, to try to broker a deal to release Israeli hostages held in Gaza. Pakistan says two of its citizens have been killed on its soil by agents hired by India. Apple users in the European Union will have access to alternative app stores, a move that the firm has previously resisted. Also in this podcast... The remains were very well preserved. There was bone, skin, fingernails, toenails and a kidney were located. In a rare discovery, a human skeleton dating back more than 2,000 years has been found in Northern Ireland. President Biden has appointed the director of the CIA, William Burns, to help broker a deal on the Israeli hostages being held in Gaza. He's to meet the Prime Minister of Qatar and a top official from Israel's intelligence service in France soon. Against this backdrop, there's another imminent deadline for people in southern Gaza. The UN says Israel has ordered tens of thousands of Palestinians sheltering in a UN compound in the city of Khan Yunis to leave by Friday evening at 5pm local time. Israel's military says it's attacking militants in western Khan Yunis with tanks and airstrikes. These Palestinians who fled the fighting say they're in a desperate situation. We were sitting minding our own business when suddenly tanks arrived and opened fire on us. I don't know how I managed to get out, but praise be to God, I made it this far. The situation is catastrophic. There's no water. It's very hard to find food. Food and water are scarce. There are no vegetables. Even the sick at the hospital can't have healthy, proper meals. People are just fleeing. There are those who were injured, some were martyred. They are all heading towards the coast, and from there to Rafa. I asked our correspondent in Jerusalem, Mark Lowen, more about the Israeli order. An Israeli evacuation order has been issued for that training centre, which is thought to be sheltering around 30,000 people. One of the buildings in the training centre was hit by fire on Wednesday that uh, is said to have killed at least a dozen people and left more than 70 people injured. Now, the evacuation order is by Friday at 5pm local time, basically ordering people to move south towards Rafa, which is uh, right on the southern tip of Gaza, on the border with, with Egypt, and is already crammed full of people thought to have about one and a half million people sheltering there. Now, in terms of how easy it is to actually get out of that area around Khan Yunis, well, the Israeli military has surrounded Khan Yunis, has encircled it. But the UN says that the attack on the training centre on Wednesday was egregious and that they had shared the coordinates with the Israeli authorities about that facility. Israel says that it has investigated and it was not behind that attack and has suggested that it could have been a Hamas rocket. There are still many people in and around Khan Yunis in hospitals uh, and the Hamas-run health ministry is saying that the conditions there are deteriorating. Again, it's going to be very difficult for, for those individuals to, to, to flee if they're incapacitated. Yes, the UN says that women who had just given birth by C-section in one of three remaining partly functional hospitals in the south around Khan Yunis were forced to evacuate in the middle of the night. Now, that hospital from which they did evacuate has now stopped functioning, leaving two left. Remember, the World Health Organization says that two-thirds of the hospitals across Gaza no longer function at all, and only a third are partly functioning. The Israeli ambassador to the UN in Geneva, Merav Elion Shahar, very strong words coming out of her, saying, look, the WHO is showing some kind of collusion because they're ignoring the fact, in her words, that Hamas-run hospitals are being used for terrorist organisations, for terrorist activity. Very strong words coming out there. They are, and I think very much shows that Israel increasingly feels that a, a sort of an array of international bodies are stacked against it and that there is a sort of international bias from institutions, largely UN bodies, and 
and that they take the court of international public opinion with them. So it all might come to a head, really, on Friday when the International Court of Justice in The Hague is to issue preliminary instructions about South Africa's case that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza, which, of course, Israel absolutely thoroughly refutes. Mark Lowen. Pakistan has accused India of killing two of its citizens on its territory. The Foreign Secretary, Mohammed Cyrus Qazi, said there was evidence that Indian agents were involved in the assassinations in Pakistan. Caroline Davis reports. The Secretary did not explain why India may have wished to kill the two men. India has previously claimed one was a militant connected to an attack on an Indian Air Force base. Pakistan suggested that these killings followed a similar pattern to targeted killings of Sikh separatists allegedly carried out or attempted by India on Canadian and American soil last year. Pakistan said that India must be held accountable for violating Pakistan's sovereignty. India responded, calling Pakistan the epicentre of terrorism, organised crime and illegal transnational activities. Caroline Davis. A day after a Russian plane crashed near the border with Ukraine, the war of words about what happened continues. Russia says Ukraine shot down the plane, which it adds was returning Ukrainian prisoners of war. It says that investigators at the site of the crash in the Russian Belgorod region near Ukraine's border have found missile fragments. But Oleksandr Merezko, a Ukrainian member of parliament, says Moscow is not to be trusted. Russia is known for distorting facts and for holding uh, in information and uh, psychological propagandistic campaigns. So the information from Russia should not be trusted under any circumstances. We don't know who had uh, shot down uh, the military plane and who was aboard this plane. That's the reason why our president made a statement and is demanding to hold uh, independent international investigation. BBC Russia news editor Famil Ismailov told me more about what Moscow is saying about the plane. Russian authorities reported that the black boxes have been discovered of the uh, Il-76 that was shot down. And uh, they will be able to discover what was what were the last seconds and minutes of the flight, and uh, they will be able to check the chat between the crew and the air traffic control, and probably that will give us more technical detail on what has happened to the plane. However, the Ukrainian side demands that the investigation is conducted by an international body, and the Russians do not accept that. And the importance of that is not lost on anybody, given what happened on previous crashes in eastern Ukraine, MH17. Explain why it's so significant that you get independent experts on the ground. First, Russians are able to sort of twist the facts and also able to technically create falsified facts on the ground. We've seen uh, with MH17, the Malaysian Airlines plane that was shot down above Ukraine in 2014, how Russia was employing all possible technical skills and even propaganda skills to make sure that the fact that the plane was shot by a book missile, a Russian missile on a Russian launcher, they tried to cover this up as much as they could. And more, they were trying to bring in all sorts of conspiracy theories in this particular case, we still have too many questions. The Russian side says that there were 65 prisoners of war on board that were taken for exchange with the Russian prisoners on the Ukrainian side. That's fine. But the question is why the Ukrainian side wasn't informed of the movement of that particular transport plane, as Ukrainian side insists that they haven't. To a lot of people, this might seem tragic, but uh, it's still a, a sideshow to, to the broader issue of the war. So how important is it in terms of the information war that Russia comes out of this being seen to be the, the, the moral player, if you like? This is very much part of the information war because Russia does not divide information as a tool or propaganda as a tool, as a weapon of the war. Starting with the families of the prisoners who were to be exchanged to blame and increase the pressure on on leadership of Ukraine to start thinking about the peace negotiations and a compromise that would leave Russia with the territories that is is occupying at the moment 
in Ukraine. BBC Russia news editor Famil Ismailov. Well, according to Moscow, has sentenced the Russian nationalist Igor Gurkin to four years in jail for inciting extremism. Gurkin has repeatedly criticised President Vladimir Putin and the conduct of the war in Ukraine. He was a leader of the Russian-backed forces who began fighting in eastern Ukraine in 2014. Our Russia editor, Steve Rosenberg, was at the sentencing hearing in Moscow. Igor Gierkin had already been convicted by a Dutch court in absentia for shooting down a Malaysian Airlines flight in eastern Ukraine and sentenced to life imprisonment, which he'd ignored. But now he is going to prison, though not for the murder of 298 people on board MH17. Today, a judge in Moscow found Mr Girkin guilty on extremism charges and sentenced him to four years in a penal colony. The former FSB officer had become a vocal critic of how the war in Ukraine is being fought. Not hard enough, in his view, but his problems began when he began to insult Vladimir Putin. Last year, the ultra-nationalist pro-war blogger had called the Kremlin leader a non-entity and a cowardly waste of space. A few days later, he was arrested. In 2014, Mr Girkin had played a key role in the early stages of Russia's war in Ukraine, commanding pro-Russian militias in the Donbass. In recent years, the Kremlin has cleared the political landscape to remove liberal, pro-democracy, pro-Western rivals. The decision to send Igor Girkin to jail suggests it's now targeting individuals at the opposite end of the spectrum, the so-called ultra-patriots. It sees them, too, as a threat. Steve Rosenberg. In a separate development, a Russian woman has been sentenced to 27 years in prison for the killing of a pro-war blogger last April. Vladlen Tatarsky died when a bomb hidden inside a small statue given to him by Daria Trepova exploded in St. Petersburg. Trepova, who's 26, said she thought the statuette contained a listening device. Her sentence is one of the longest ever imposed on a woman in Russia. Now, from Russia to neighbouring Georgia. Thousands of people in the country have found out that they were stolen from their parents at birth and sold. It's believed the black market in baby trafficking operated for decades, from the late 1970s up to the mid-2000s. Some of the victims are now taking their cases to the Georgian courts, hoping to get access to their birth documents so they can trace their biological families. Fay Nurse reports. <laughs> Amy and Anno have travelled to Germany from Georgia to meet their mother, Azza, for the first time. The identical twins were nervous about seeing her. They only learned they were sisters two years ago after they were separated at birth and illegally adopted. (laughs) Azza was told by doctors her daughters had died shortly after giving birth. From today, my life has great meaning. I'm so happy that I've found my children. For the twins, the reunion causes mixed emotions. Amy is overwhelmed at finding her mother. I felt something like I've never felt. Yeah, I'm shaking. I just want to comfort her because I know what she's feeling. Anno is angry at the web of lies. I don't know why, but when she hugged me, I felt more anger than anything else. How the twins found each other is nothing short of miraculous. Amy, a punky 21-year-old, posted a video of herself getting her eyebrow pierced. A friend saw the video and sent it to Anno. One of my friends sent me a TikTok video of Amy. When I saw her, I thought I was looking at myself. They exchanged messages and eventually decided to meet up at a train station. I was like, oh my God. (laughs) Um, Am I looking in the mirror? Exact same person? Exact same faces? Exact same voice? Is it the same thoughts? They both decided to confront their parents. We talked to our families and found out that we were both sold illegally as children. I was heartbroken. My whole life is a lie. 
That was the first feeling I had. But they soon realised they weren't alone when they came across a Facebook group with more than 230,000 members, all sharing similar stories, all hunting for the truth. It was set up by a famous Georgian TV personality, Tamuna Muzaritsa, who is also looking for her family. She discovered she was adopted after finding another birth certificate with incorrect details. When we meet Tamuna, she is on the phone advising someone on their case. Mm -hmm. Everything exploded, message after message after message. Mothers looking for children, children looking for the mothers. Tamuna had opened a dark chapter in Georgia's history, tens of thousands of babies trafficked over decades. She started working with human rights lawyer Liam Mukshavaria to try to bring justice to the families. First, there are the cases where the biological mother voluntarily gave up the child, either for money or for another reason. The second is a larger group of tragic stories where a mother is lied to in the maternity unit that her baby has died. It's hard to understand how such a large illegal operation could thrive in a small country. Leah explains a culture of shame around adoption and the turbulence following Georgia's independence from the Soviet Union played a part. People were poor and criminality thrived. Adoption was not properly regulated by the state, so people tried to solve this issue on their own. One thing I can say with certainty is that this illegal adoption was systemic and it operated and existed all over the country. Leah and Tamuna's work means that some cases could end up in court, but Tamuna still hasn't found her own family. The saddest part of my story is that I have reunited hundreds of families and I cannot find my biological parents. Georgia's government says it's investigating, but no arrests have been made. That report by Faye Nurse, and you can watch the full documentary Betrayal at Birth, Georgia's Stolen Children, on the BBC World Service YouTube channel. Now, it could be the opening line in a crime novel, Body Found in Bog. But in reality, it emerges that a very old body turns out to be ancient human remains dating back over 2,000 years have been found in Peatland in Northern Ireland. The well-preserved bones are thought to be those of a teenage boy. It's the first time that radiocarbon dating has been used on a body found in a bog in Northern Ireland. Our island correspondent, Sarah Girvin, reports. In October last year, bog land outside the town of Balahi revealed a secret it had been keeping for more than 2,000 years. A bone protruding through soil launched a police investigation. The remains discovered as a result have been carbon dated to around 500 BC. Detective Inspector Nicky Dehan was part of the team that spent three days uncovering them. The remains were very well preserved. Um, There was bone, skin, fingernails, toenails and a kidney were located. They were able to determine that... The age of the remains would have been between about 13 and 17 years at the time of death and possibly a male. Dr Alistair Ruffel is a forensic geologist. All the bog bodies worldwide, Germany, Denmark, Ireland, are all given names, partly on the location, partly out of, out of respect. I give my own alliter- alliterative name, which is Belaki Boy, because of where we're near. The remains will now go to a museum for scientific study and possibly will one day be put on public display. Sarah Gervin reporting from Northern Ireland. Still to come. The line seems relaxed. It's in the back seat, the upper half of its body, hanging off the side of the car, two big paws on the doors. Driving while in possession of a lion. The strange charge sheet from Thailand. Hi, I'm Una Chaplin, and I'm the host of a new podcast called Hollywood Exiles. It tells the story of how my grandfather, Charlie Chaplin, and many others were caught up in a campaign to root out communism in Hollywood. It's a story of glamour and scandal and political intrigue and a battle for the soul of a nation. Hollywood Exiles from CBC Podcasts and the BBC World Service. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. 
Welcome back to the Global News Podcast. Now to the United States. And the former president, Donald Trump, has testified briefly at a New York court as part of his defence in a defamation case brought by the fashion writer Eugene Carroll. At stake is the amount of damages Mr Trump will have to pay for making defamatory statements against Ms Carroll. Well, the former president has continued to deny he has ever met Ms Carroll, despite a previous trial finding that he'd sexually assaulted her. Nada Torfe reports from New York. Outlining the ground rules for Donald Trump's testimony took longer than the testimony itself. The judge left no room for him to go beyond the agreed terms, making it impossible for him to launch into a monologue or to campaign from the witness stand. He answered just a few questions, saying that he stood by his deposition that E. Jean Carroll's claims that he raped her were a hoax, then that he did not instruct anyone to hurt Miss Carroll, and that he had wanted to defend himself, his family, and the presidency. The latter part, the judge ordered stricken from the record. But that still didn't stop the former president from uttering, this is not America from the defense table, where he wasn't under oath. Donald Trump is testing the limits of the courts in his legal cases, but he is keeping his supporters invested and tuned in. And more importantly, he's receiving considerable press coverage as he campaigns for the Republican presidential nomination. Never terrific. Next to Brazil, where police have raided the home of the former President Jair Bolsonaro's old spy chief, Alexandre Hamadzen, now a member of Congress. It's part of an investigation into the alleged monitoring of thousands of people, including two Supreme Court judges who were seen as hostile to the former president. Mr Hamadzen says he's done nothing wrong. Our America's regional editor, Leonardo Russia, told me more. The main focus of the investigation is the former spy chief, the former head of the Brazilian intelligence agency, Alexandre Hamagin. So they went into his office. He's now a member of Congress. They they seized phones and they seized material linked to him. And Brazilian media are also reporting that seven current federal police officers have been suspended because they are supposed to be involved in these illegal operations. Many times during the Bolsonaro government, there were allegations that he was putting the secret services and also the federal police and people close to him to his service, basically to protect his interests and to protect people close to him, including his children. Three of them are, are politicians. They were being investigated, and, and these are the main allegations that link him to this alleged parallel scheme inside the, the intelligence agency. And what about comments from Mr. Bolsonaro? Have we heard from him? No, we haven't heard from him. We have heard from the main person there investigating, Mr. Amajin. He said that what they did is they mixed up new information with out-of-date information. They made what they called a mixed salad of, of events, you know, and put it all together for political reasons, and they produced a very misleading report. That's what he's saying. He says he hasn't done anything wrong. He's not involved in any illegal activities. And where does this leave Mr. Bolsonaro, who's still under multiple investigations, isn't he? It's very bad for him. I mean, he's been banned from running for office for other reasons, for using public services to criticise uh, Brazilian democracy. He's banned from running for office until 2030. But he's a very influential figure. He has children who are prominent politicians. And this person, Alexandre Hamagin, is still the favourite candidate for you know, supported by the Bolsonaro movement to run for mayor of Rio, which is quite an important job. It's, it can be seen as a springboard to, to test him as a possible presidential candidate. He's in a very bad situation. It all looks very bad for Mr. Bolsonaro, and that has been the only talking point in Brazil during the day. Leonardo Rocha. The US technology company Apple has announced that from March, people using its devices like iPhones in the European Union will be able to download apps from rival providers and not just from its own store, as is currently the case. The decision represents a major U-turn for the company. Our technology editor Zoe Kleinman reports. You could almost hear the gritting of teeth as Apple announced its changes to App Store policies in Europe. The tech giants being forced to change its practices following the introduction of new EU rules designed to improve competition. Apple has fought strongly against this when challenged in the past. The company's ecosystem is sometimes described as a walled garden. This means that only apps which it has approved can go onto its devices and all in-app payments have to be made through its own systems. 
It says this allows it to offer its customers better security and there is much less malware on Apple devices as a result. But developers argue they have no alternative but to jump through Apple's hoops and pay its commission fees. Game maker Epic withdrew the app of the hit game Fortnite from Apple in 2020 in protest against restrictions. The changes will not currently affect the UK, but proposals for similar legislation to the EU are currently making their way through Parliament. Zoe Kleiman. One of the most ambitious and most expensive space missions ever mounted in Europe has just been approved after being in development for decades. The Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, or LISA, will try to detect the ripples in the fabric of space that are generated when gargantuan so-called black holes collide. Here's our science correspondent, Jonathan Amos. LISA is one of the grand scientific endeavours of the 21st century. It'll fly three identical spacecraft separated from each other by two and a half million kilometres. Lasers will flash between them to pick up the subtle warping of space that occurs when black holes, millions of times the mass of our sun, merge together. To work, the technology will need to sense changes in the path of the lasers that are equivalent to just fractions of the diameter of an atom. LISA has already been in development for three decades, and its complexity means it still won't be ready to launch until 2035. The total project cost will probably exceed $2.5 billion. But scientists are convinced LISA's insights on the workings and history of the cosmos will be profound. Jonathan Amos. Now, it wasn't your average traffic infringement in Thailand. A woman was driving down a busy street in the east of the country in her luxury open-top Bentley car and with her was a lion. Well, in a video of the incident, people on motorbikes can be seen nervously passing the animal which had its head and two paws hanging outside the car, facing into the oncoming traffic. Stephanie Prentice told me more. This was taking the roar of traffic to new levels. Uh, The video of this incident showed a large lion just cruising through the streets. It seemed like it was being kept as a pet. From the video, it would seem these uh, sort of drives weren't out of the ordinary for this household because there's two passengers in the front seat, seemingly not really paying that much attention to the lion. The lion seems relaxed. It's in the back seat, the upper half of its body hanging off the side of the car, two big paws on the doors, and the uh, motorist going past in the other direction, seemingly quite concerned. It was wearing a collar and it seemed to be chained in. A woman in the car, she's thought to be the owner, she's been charged with having an unregistered lion, but crucially not with having one. That's actually allowed. And a Sri Lankan man who's in the car too, he's left the country after the video of this incident went viral. He's believed to be the lion supplier and is facing charges as well. So having a cat like that is not a problem. Having potentially dangerous big pets is fairly common in that region. Well, having a a big cat in Thailand is seen by some as a status symbol in Pattaya, where this lion was spotted. There's videos on their local Facebook groups of pet lions actually getting loose at night. A man in the area actually keeps two of them as pets and he walks them on a lead. And there's people in these forums saying they have to rush to get their children inside when they see the lions and concerned over what they call a trend in keeping these big cats. But it's not just confined there. It's down by the East Coast. Officials say there are currently... 224 lions across the country that are legally owned. However, the owners are supposed to keep them in a specified location, not just take them out for a drive. And the owner of this particular lion in the video could now face up to six months in jail. Stephanie Prentice. The American singer-songwriter Melanie Safka, known globally as Melanie, has died at the age of 76.